What it, what, it, what it boils down to, what it boils down to is the equivalent of an automobile. You can have a magnificent vehicle, but if you don't have sufficient fuel, you're going to stall. Too much fuel, you flood the engine just the right amount, you have a chance to move ahead. Same is true of monetary policy. You can have basic strengths in your economy, but if you don't have sufficient money credit, you got a problem. You're going to stall. Too much, you're going to get the economic equivalent of flooding the engine. The right amount, you have a chance to move ahead. This economic crisis, and it is a financial one, finance in a modern economy is the equivalent of the heart. You can have great muscles, you can have a great brain, but if your heart's in trouble, you are in trouble. The problem with the Federal Reserve was it printed too much money, starting in 2003 and onwards. Kept interest rates artificially low. The blunt truth is you could not have had a housing bubble, certainly not of the magnitude we did, if all that excess money had not been printed. Compounding it was another government creation, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. By early 2008, it guaranteed $1.6 trillion of junk mortgages. Then you had mark-to-market accounting, another utterly boring subject, which gratuitously destroyed, uh, Richard gets it, gratuitous, <laughs> yeah. gratuitously destroyed bank capital, turned the equivalent of a flood into a tsunami, and other mistakes like cartelizing credit rating agencies, not enforcing proper rules on short selling and the like. So, but all that happens after these disasters, which has their origins in massive government mistakes, is the free markets get the rap for it. In a normal economy, people have a chance and do move upward. The IRS did a survey of tax returns, for example, a couple of years ago, looked at people's tax returns from the mid-1990s to the middle part of this decade to see what actually happened. There's an assumption that in a capitalist society, everything is static. It isn't. It fluctuates. It is mobile, upwards and downwards. Between 1995 and 2004, these tax returns found that people who began in the lowest quintile, most of them went up in that 10-year period, just in a 10-year period, one quintile, two quintiles, a handful even moved right up to the top quintile. And so it is not static. It is mobile. And when you also factor in that this country is receiving immigrants, at least until this economic crisis, put aside the issue of illegal and illegal, we have tracked millions of people to this country over time. Most of them come here with very little. Most of them start at the bottom. They come here precisely because they know they have an opportunity to move up or at least provide an opportunity for the kids to move up. So the pessimism we have today is not new. You saw it in the late 70s, Malays. You saw a profound dispirit of the American spirit in the 1930s, especially in the late 30s when people thought we were actually climbing out of the Depression. Then it got smashed again in the Depression of 37 and 1938. So we've had times where our morale has been hit before. But we've also had times where reforms were put in, as happened in the early 1980s. That's why they always stop at 1973 and then begin with Ronald Reagan, forgetting the disasters of the 1970s. And then we move upward and onward and do provide that kind of opportunity. If you look at the crises of today, when people talk about what do we do about health care, what do we do about Social Security, <clears throat> People forget that the essence of economics, and this is where economists should be shot when they say e economics is about the redistribute, distributing or the allocation of scarce resources. Allocation of scarce resources. My God, boy, that's really exciting. It's really about turning today's scarcities into tomorrow's abundances. Take, for example, the automobile. 110 years ago, cost the equivalent of $150,000, $200,000 a toy for the rich. Henry Ford comes along, moving assembly line, a toy for the rich now becomes affordable to every working person. Cell phones, what were cell phones 20, 15, 20 years ago? They're bigger than a shoebox, clunky, expensive things. Now today, small, they're not just phones, they're everything. And, uh, and you look around the world, four billion people now have cell, there are four billion cell phones. Even in Haiti, the, re the poverty area, stricken areas of India now have these things, turning scarce scarcities into abundances. Can it be done in health care? Of course it can be done. What's more basic than health care? It is food. Without food, you don't have health. Do we have a food crisis in this country? The only crisis we have in most of the time in food is that some of us eat too much of it. Uh, farmers grow too much of it. Richard talked about the perversion of subsidies. But if people don't have food, we have programs in place to make sure they do, like food stamps. Why can't you do the same thing in health care? 
Just think of it in healthcare. We don't have real free enterprise in healthcare. The proof of it is if you go to a doctor, you go to a hospital, you go to a clinic, and you actually ask what it's going to cost, why either you're crazy or you don't have insurance. Why else would you want to know what it costs? Whereas anything else you do, first thing you want to know is what's it going to cost, what am I going to get for it? So in healthcare, you uh, get real entrepreneurship there, remove the barriers, and there are various ways we can do it, and we can get to that in the Q&A if you wish. You can get real entrepreneurship and do what you've done with cell phones, automobiles, iPods, and everything else, and food, and that is turn scarcities into abundances and have entrepreneurs compete in providing more and more healthcare at more and more affordable costs. And Social Security, my generation is hopeless. Uh, it's a sunk cost. We didn't finance it right. But for younger people, allow them to have their own personal accounts, properly regulation in terms of diversification and the like, so that you accumulate capital, and that way that uh, starts to use, even if you're on minimum wage, you just have a summer job, you're starting to accumulate capital, you choose your own retirement age. If you want to do it at 60 or 98, you make the choice, and you also create more wealth. Theory, no. Real world, Galveston, Texas, three counties pulled out of Social Security in the early 80s. When you're allowed to do that, they didn't put one penny of that money into uh, the, the equity markets. They just uh, guaranteed insurance contracts, CDs, and the like. Result today, those benefits are higher than they would have had with Social Security. Person making as low as $17,000 a year would get a little over $600, $683, I think, with a couple on Social Security, over $1,100 with what they did in those three counties. So in terms of where we're at, how do we create more opportunity? Yes, we can uh, get into the uh, theology of uh, helping those who need help, but I think basically people understand if people have genuine needs, we find a way to help them, whether it's an acute emergency or something else. But in terms of creating opportunity where people start with very little but the drive to get ahead, indeed, we make these positive reforms and we can move ahead. We've done it before. No reason why we can't overcome this malaise and show once again what a free and spirited people can achieve. Thank you.